He learned theological German while serving time in a Berlin prison. After he escaped, he would return every Thursday to preach in the chapel and drink schnapps with the guards. The oral defense of his doctoral thesis lasted a record-breaking 73 hours. The examiners did not find anything wrong with his thesis, they just really liked talking to him. He once explained hermeneutics to Paul Ricoeur while cooking authentic Chicago deep dish pizza. His exegesis is so thick that scientists have given a place on the periodic table. It's called exegeticum. His theology is so poetic that it made Stanley Howarass temporarily stop swearing. Archaeologists claim that the Holy Grail is searching for him. His beard alone has received three honorary doctorates from Swedish universities. When it was rumored that his book on scripture was going to be made into a movie, it immediately received 12 Oscar nominations. A church in Arizona claims that he's the third eagle of the apocalypse. When theologians at Yale and Harvard mention the KJV, they're talking about him. His name is Kevin James Van Hooster, and he is the most interesting theologian in the world. In this special off card episode of the Now and Not Yet, we look at a book on hell. Mike Bird catches up with New Testament scholar Tom Schreiner, and we review a book on the oldest church in the world. Hot off the press. Okay, this is a special edition of Hot Off the Press. It's really, really hot. I'll be back in a second. Ah! Ah! Whoa! Uh, that is fire and brimstone hot. This is really hot. This oh. is a book about hell. Oh, that is hot. Mm. So, Mike, the doctrine of hell is a very controversial topic. Oh, yeah. Why is that? Well, I guess it's, it's, there's so much involved in it. I mean, it's the idea of, of people being punished or tormented for all eternity. And at one level, that, that's not a pleasant thought. I mean, even, even for the wicked. I mean, do you want to throw them into a fire where they, uh, they, they writhe in pain and agony for all eternities? Is that disproportionate? I mean, or is all this language just metaphorical? You know, that type of a thing. And you know, what about you know, the people we love who, uh, who, who didn't know Christ? Do they suffer forever? Mm. Or are they annihilated? Does, does hell have an exit door? Do we get a second chance? Yeah, right. uh, these are the kind of things that people want to know and the things they're kind of worried about. Yeah, it's a very big issue. I remember, Mike, uh, in pastoral ministry, um, it's a massive issue at funerals mm. and also when you have couples where you have one parent who's a Christian, the other one isn't, and the kids come along to Sunday school and they want to know what happens mm. to people after they die. So yeah. it's a really big question. This is a very helpful volume. It's the four views on hell. It's the second edition, the first volume of this appeared in the late 90s. So firstly, we have an essay on a, I guess, orthodox understanding of hell, that it involves final separation from God, unending torment and retribution. The second contribution is what's understood and labeled as lim limited uh, torment view, um, the annihilationist position. People go to hell, but after an experience, they vanish and become nothing. Then thirdly, we have a universalist position um, by Ro Robin Perry, where ultimately everybody is saved, even if there is some kind of experience of hell. And the fourth essay in this volume is a very speculative essay on purgatory for Protestants, essentially. I just want to take you through a couple of issues to do okay. with this book, Mike. Yeah. The first essay by Denny Burke is trying to make sense of the biblical material using a threefold rubric, that is, when we look at all the passages that contribute to the traditional view of hell, yeah. is it fair to say that each of them speaks of separation from God, unending torment, and retribution? Is it fair to say those things? And so he works towards systematic claims that way, yeah. taking each biblical verse, breaking it down in that threefold manner, making theological claims. Yeah. That's very interesting because the, the next few essays in the book say, well, wait a minute, we want to think 
with a different hermeneutic. And the hermeneutic, the other essays employ, the universalist one and yep. the annihilationist, they want to start with the doctrine of God. Ah, and they want to go, given who God is and where the story is going, does the eternal torment position make sense? Yeah. So very different methodologies at play. And I think, especially Robin Parry's essay, the universalist essay, yeah. that is one that people who are, I guess, by nature, more theological yeah. will be drawn to first. Um, I believe that the best work here is by Denny Burke, yeah. the biblical exegesis on the orthodox position. It's the strongest essay and that the burden of proof really lies with the annihilationists yeah, well, and the universe. I know Denny. I owe the guy a pizza. Oh, okay. And he's a great skateboarder too. No way. He skateboards. Oh, that's great. You've got to, you've got to introduce me. I, I will do. That I, would well, be great. Pizza and skateboarding? Pizza and skateboarding. Okay, so what would his view of heaven look like then? Um, I don't know, but because he's Southern Baptist, you can bet there's fried chicken involved. And a suit. He probably skates in a suit. Probably it's fried chicken in a suit. Fantastic. Who wouldn't? <laughs> Anyhow, so this is a very helpful volume because it's very substantial. At the end of each essay, there are responses by the other authors in the book. And those uh, responses are fair. And the real question is, where is the warrant for your view? So I find this a very helpful book. It models different kinds of hermeneutics, yep. method, and scholarly engagement. So this is the kind of book I'm going to be using this semester in class on the issue of hell. I highly recommend it, and you can get it wherever good books are sold. But now and not yet. Mike, I'm really worried. It sounds like Trump could become the president of the USA. Relax, Scott. I've got five surefire tips to help anyone survive a Trump presidency. Okay. Tip number five, make a small Mitt Romney doll and hug it, and then say to yourself, Mitt, I really, really miss you. Tip number four, sign off all your tweets, hashtag make America sane again. Number three, Build a wall around your house and make Trump voters pay for it. Number two, smuggle Megyn Kelly to Mexico on the Underground Railway. And number one, stock up on authentic Mexican food because if Trump is elected, it might become suddenly scarce. That's how you survive a Trump presidency. Thank you, Mike. Hi, I have in the studio today none other than the well-known New Testament scholar, Tom Schreiner. Tom, welcome to Ridley College and welcome to the now and the not yet. Thank you, Mike. It's great to be here. Great to see you. Great. Now, Tom, I have to ask you one particular question. I read something on the internet, so you know it's true, and it said that their students at Southern Seminary, where you teach, have built a shrine in your honor and they like go there and light candles and you know they get your like teaching assistants to anoint them with oil because they want to receive the saint tom the exegete blessing to help them in their theological studies i need to know tom is this true well mike i i think um maybe you've had a really bad dream or nightmare and you thought you read that on the internet but no, actually, I, I, def I definitely read it on the internet. I definitely read. I, I even saw pictures of people at this shrine, and there was a picture of you and your books, and they were holding a candle. Uh, I mean, I think that nightmare must have been very realistic. Oh, it must have been there. Yeah, so. It must have been there. Actually, I know the article is real because I wrote it. Okay. Uh, but anyway, shenanigans aside, shenanigans aside, Tom, what brings you to Melbourne? I uh, came here to give the Ridley Lecture, the Leon Morris Ridley yep, Lecture. Yep, our, our annual lecture in New Testament mm. studies. Mm. And you talked on? I talked on the warning passages in Hebrews. Ah, is that like the thing where we can lose our salvation? Well, some people think that. Yeah. That's one interpretation. Well, what, what do you think? What do you I, think, Tom? I, I argued that the warnings are given in Hebrews are a means by which God keeps his own. The warnings are a means by which God preserves his elect. So those warnings actually provoke us and stimulate us to keep uh, following Jesus. But that doesn't mean the warnings aren't real. No, it's precisely by it's precisely by heeding the warning, by taking the warning seriously, that you're yep. provoked to uh, persevere and to continue. 
So uh, it's, it's those who don't take the warning seriously who are in danger, actually. Okay, that sounds excellent. Uh, can you tell us, Tom, what else are you working on these days? I'm, do I'm revising my 1998 Romans commentary for uh, Baker. I hope to have it out by, uh, or, or to be finished by yeah. January 1st next year. Yeah, I, I love that. But out of all your books, that is actually my favorite, your, your 1998 Romans commentary. So I think I think it's it's I like everything you do in that, particularly in Romans six on mm. on baptism, and uh, and I like I like the way in that book you, you kind of bring a sort of traditional reformed view, but you kind of bring in a bit of you know cool German stuff, you get a little bit of bit of Sturmacher going mm. down, you yeah. know, yeah. if if you're into that kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, but I, I I like that volume, and I thought I thought it was a very solid sober uh, uh, volume, and, and and there's a plethora of Romans commentaries out there. Uh, but I always, when I wrote my own, own Romans commentary, it was like, it was like you, Wright, Dunn and Jewett were kind of like the top four, you know, little friends I always had around me to consult mm. me about, you know, mm. uh, uh, to help me work out my own thoughts. So yeah, I'm, well, I'm glad you. you're, I'm glad you're revising that. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, no, oh, it's great fun. And you know, oh, yeah. so much has been written in the last 20 years. I know. Many commentators, and including yours. Yeah, I know. Yeah. But I mean, you've got all sorts of things. You've had Jewett's volume come out. Uh, Tom Wright's got his like um, 2002 thing, so uh, it's, it's just like a, a never-ending waterfall of publications, which at one level can be so despairing, yeah. because it's you know yeah. it's impossible to get a, to a grip and a grasp of all of it. Uh, but you just you just have to get in your little kayak and sail down yeah. the waterfall yeah. and see where you end up. Even the first time, you know, mm. I was asked to do it by Baker, I thought, should I do it? So many commentaries mm. on Romans, and it's, it's even more the case this time. But how can you pass up Romans? I know, yeah. I know. But what I find interesting is when Calvin wrote his Romans, Romans commentary, there had been like 10 published in the last few years, and Calvin begins his Romans commentary by saying, look, I know you're all thinking the last thing we need is another Romans commentary, uh, but, he says, I don't think anyone has said everything that needs to be said, and I think what I had to say would be useful. Yeah, and the other thing yeah. Calvin says that I really like is he says, I'm aiming for lucid brevity. So he yeah. says about some of the other commentators, I think he says about Booser, mm. Booser's way too long. Yeah. You won't read Booser, but you'll, you'll read me because I have lucid brevity. And I think Calvin really accomplished that. He's still read today, yeah. which I, I don't think either of us will be read in if history lasts that long in 400 years. Yeah, all, all the jokes I use in my Romans commentary, like things about jokes about the Kardashians, yeah. uh, <laughs> they're pretty much dateable within 10 years. So, but who knows, maybe a second edition. But anyway, getting to, to a more serious note, uh, Tom, you're also an educator. Uh, you, in, in one, you, you are a pastor to your students and you train pastors. Mm. If I can ask you a hypothetical question. Mm. If you had to give one of your students a final piece of advice, mm. knowing you would never see them or speak to them again. What final piece of advice would you give to that student? Uh, I'd say to that student, you want, you want to tie yourself in your ministry to the biblical text. Okay. Uh, if you know, focus, focus on the scriptures. I mean, you've learned a lot, a lot from so many different sources, but finally, finally, your, your resource is the Bible. Yeah. That's your authority. So immerse yourself in the scriptures. The, the commentators were all just commentators. Yeah. That, that's the, the primary sources. It's yeah. so easy even for us to get away from the primary sources and look yeah. at the secondary sources. Great. Okay. So keep applying ourselves to the word for the rest of our lives. Apply yourself to the text, as Bengal said. Yep, excellent. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for joining us in the Now and the Not Yet, Tom, and I uh, wish you every blessing in the future in all your studies and teaching. Thank you so much, Mike. Great to be with you. It's our pleasure. Archaeology. Mike, there's a fantastic book on the world's oldest church. Yep, who's it by? Michael Papard. Ah, oh, yep, he's a young up-and-coming Catholic scholar. Oh man, I really hope that he's got an uncle called George. That would be so cool. That would be A-team cool. Wait, George? Who's that? You know, George Papard. No. George Papard. No, I don't know. Who the George... actor. No. Man from Uncle, the A-team. Oh, okay. A -team Hannibal, Hannibal from the A-team. Okay, that... Okay, let's see if that makes this book better. I hope it does. All right. Everything's better with the A-Team. <laughs> Everything's better with the A-Team. So, this is a book about the world's oldest church, which was a home built in the 230s and then renovated into a church in the 240s in Syria. And very luckily for us, Mike, it was deliberately buried 
by Roman soldiers because the church was connected to a wall that was being used as a fortification against another army. So it's a church that's been almost deliberately preserved for us. And what Michael Papad tries to do in this book is to take us imaginatively into the church building and its frescoes. It has some amazing frescoes in it. And these are beautifully um, retained and illustrated for us in the book. And it's one of the reasons why I use it in, in, in the classroom, actually, is that it's got really nice pictures of the frescoes themselves, as you can see. Oh, awesome. And it also has great diagrams of where the church fitted into the rest of the fortifications and the religious centre and other diagrams near the front of the book, which I'll be using in my early uh, Christianity course, give you um, the, uh, an architectural diagram and recreation of what the building would have looked like itself. So it's a very helpful book, even on that level, to say, hey, this is what a Syrian church looked like, like in the 240s. So this, this is a pre-Constantine yes. church we have yes. from, the, from the east in, in modern-day Syria. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's pretty awesome. That's 18 awesome. It is, it is A-Team Awesome. Um, now, so that's what the book does in the first um, step, is to say, here's the story of how this really ancient building was discovered, this is why it's preserved, and this is what's in it. All these frescoes, including women, King David, there's some sketches of Adam and Eve, uh, miracle stories of Jesus, the woman at the well, and so forth. The next bit of what Papad does is somewhat controversial, Mike. Okay. Papad wants to reimagine how the rituals within the building would have drawn on the images in the frescoes. And then he goes on to make some very controversial claims about what early Christianity looked like in Syria before it was uh, affected by other theologies. Now, Papad says that he sets out to explore ritual and conversation with uh, the Bible and ancient Christianity. But what you find throughout the book, Mike, is that he's really interested in the Gospel of Philip and the Gospel of Thomas more than what he is in, for example, the Book of Romans. So Papad rejects what he calls death mysticism, what we would understand to be a Pauline theology of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So he's very much pushing the variegated thesis to do with early Christianity. Okay, well that's interesting because the Syriac church initially rejected all the Catholic letters in favour of just the Gospels and Paul. That's right. So although they weren't like, you know, strict Paulinists in Mm -hmm. some sense, they certainly had a high view of of Paul uh, at one point. So okay, that's, that's a curious, it's an interesting thing. Yeah, it is. So for me, this kind of book is one of those books that sparks discussion rather than settles uh, the conversation. So I'm expecting there to be a number of responses to this book. It's um, fascinating because it's such an early pre-Constantinian church. I recommend this book um, to second year students uh, and onwards in history courses. I think you need to have some understanding of historical method before you read the book and buy all of its conclusions, because it's really in the area of method that the book will either stand or fall. Okay, excellent. It's great to hear. Thank you, Scott.